Happy Monday! Welcome to the Monday Morning Data Chat. Every Monday morning, Joe Reese and Matt Housley have candid and unscripted chats about all things data, sometimes with special guests. If you want unfiltered and honest conversations about data engineering, data architecture, data science, and analytics, this is the show for you. It's time to chat, so let's get going. Good morning, Joe. How's it going? Good. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Cool. How was your weekend? Uh, it was It was good. It was a lot of work on the book. Um, I did yep. part of my work yesterday in Park City, so that was kind of nice. Just oh, fancy. Location. <laughs> How about yourself? What, what were you doing in Park City? I'm uh, just hanging out, basically. So just one nice. of my friends wanted to hang out there. So I'm like, all right, I can do that, but I've got to like write and edit the whole time. <laughs> well, so. you're, you're, that, you're that friend. I'm that friend. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's, that's awesome. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. I worked on the book as well. Um, what else? Climbed the typical stuff, you know, yeah. hike and all that crazy stuff. So yeah, it's fun. Um, and uh, yeah, I think today we want to talk about um, Matt Turk every year. Uh, he's a VC from uh, a company called First Smart Capital. Every year he writes um, an article on the data landscape. I've been a fan of his articles for a really long time. And let me just share the uh, window with you. And you've got to zoom in, right? Like um, For his graph, yeah, it's absolutely yeah. bananas, right? Well, so let's check this out. What's that? And I will say, I'll say two things about this. So first of all, the graph is way, way better than it's been in the past in terms of resolution because it was getting to the point where you couldn't at, you're so blurry, you couldn't actually see the individual company logos and such. Yeah. So it's, it's really sharp this time. You can zoom in and read everything. And the, the article this year is exceptionally fascinating, I would say. I've read a lot of these in the past. They're always good analyses, but there's just so much going on in the space that he covers and so much evolution For sure. during this year. Yeah, so he came up with a new acronym. Uh, so for people who don't know, Matt Turk's been uh, putting together these uh, infographics of the data landscape since, I believe, 2012. Um, and so the, the original one, which you can see down here, is actually, um, um, it's pretty quaint. I remember a lot of these technologies. I'll, I'll blow this up for you. So this was... Um, Basically, you can see the logos. I think it's a whole point. And the other thing I should know is like most of these companies are not in business anymore or they've been acquired. And so this is 2012. Fast forward to today, the, um, the landscape is, uh, well, I think it's intentionally absurd. You can't actually see anything. If you zoom in on this, um, you can sort of start getting an idea of, um, you know, companies and products within infrastructure, for example. You have uh, some familiar faces, S3. Azure storage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and probably a bunch of companies that you never heard of. And the crazy thing is, the crazy thing is that this is not complete. <laughs> there, no. I, I noticed there are a lot of companies actually left off of this, uh, uh, this graphic and it just keeps going and going and going and going. So compare that to, um, again, 2012. <laughs> this was the known universe of uh, data products. I think this was partially complete or mostly complete. This is partially complete here and just, insane so yeah there's just been such an explosion of activity and again i think even if you compare to last year uh to 2020 it's it's just absolutely crazy so that's right yeah that's right so what are your thoughts on this article i mean you say it's well written i i, I agree I, I think it's a very thorough as you can tell by the uh um <laughs> the browser uh progress here it's a very long article this this is uh yeah. something you'll, you'll need a, a bit of time to settle through but yeah, what were, your, what were your key thoughts on this? So some of this felt like he was preaching to the choir. In other words, he's saying a lot of things that we've kind of been telling people too. So, so one of his quotes that I really like is about cloud data warehouses. And he says, today, cloud data warehouses, Snowflake, Amazon Redshift, Google BigQuery, and lake houses, Databricks, provide the ability to store massive amounts of data in a way that's useful, not completely cost prohibitive, and doesn't require an army of technical people to maintain. In other words, after all these years, it is now quite finally possible to store and process big data. Like, yeah, that's, we, we completely agree with that statement, I would say. Um, we, in many respects, I think we consider cloud data warehouses one of the best places to handle big data 
and, and products like Databricks where they manage a lot of the details for you. And like this comment about needing an army of people to maintain a Hadoop system, that's generally what we observed as well. Um, a lot of companies got into Hadoop because they wanted to do big data cheap. And then it turned out that even fairly small organizations could end up spending a million dollars a year just on salaries to maintain the stack and try to get a little, get a little bit of work done in the process as well. Right. Yeah. It's bananas. Uh, getting a lot of comments already. Like, um, you know, this uh, sounds like it mirrors the, uh, <laughs> the actual universe. It just keeps expanding. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, I think his 2020 graphic was insane. This yeah. uh, blows that one away, but it, it speaks to the current environment we're in, right? Uh, we can we can approach this from a few angles. One, data is a very popular um, uh, segment to invest in. Therefore, yeah. it, but there's a lot of use cases as well. So it's a double-edged sword, right? There's a lot of use cases. We're seeing a lot of, um, I would say, bifurcation of technology. So whereas back in the old days, you would have bundling uh, and monolithic architectures nowadays. Uh, if you just take Informatica and chop up segments of Informatica, you basically have startups and startups within startups. And that's kind of how I view it. Yeah. And not yeah. to mention how the clouds are approaching this too with their own offerings. So there's just um, infinite offerings at this point. And uh, I don't know how anyone can make sense of the individual products. It's not like the old days. Like if you, if you again, if you go back to 2012, um, you know, this was, I would say, at least manageable. Like you could pick uh, a big data stack. Like I remember this was about the time when, you know, Hadoop was in the ecosystem was maturing uh, and everyone thought Hadoop was going to be the future of data. Um, I, I think obviously that it's been proven a bit uh, uh, wrong since then. It, it definitely set the precedent. But since then, uh, I mean, just look around you. Every company, basically, there's some sort of a data need that these uh, products or companies fulfill. Yeah, and so with that too, you couple this with a, a rise of like easy money uh, and yep. it, you know, the availability of like just dirt cheap capital to VCs and um, as a result to, to startups. And uh, this is kind of what you get. Yeah. Well, and like you said, there were what, 136 newly minted unicorns in just the first half of 2021. <laughs> that, that speaks to the amount yeah. of floating around, right? That's yeah. The data space, but still, that's absolutely insane. <laughs> it's absolutely insane. You know, when I talk to VCs as well, um, their thesis is this keeps going for a while. Um, I, I, of course, there's a debate, which we'll get into in a bit, about consolidation and, and um, you know, uh, of the industry. But right now, and, and I suppose given the number of companies, this needs to happen because this, this right. it can't be sustainable uh, in the sense that how would you ever, uh, if you're a business and a data team trying to pick products, uh, I mean, how would you ever know that you've picked the final ones that you're going to use? Yeah, and you kind of brought up an interesting point. So you, you're taking basically older tools like Informatica and refactoring them into smaller pieces. And to do that, you have to have really good interop. But uh, every every startup kind of wants to own that interop, if that makes any sense. Like they all want to be the one to define the interop standard. And not everyone can win, right? Like some are going to win, some are ultimately going to lose, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it, not just some, but most. Yeah. Yeah. Just right. I mean, there are just too many of these. Power laws, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's interesting. What What else did it stood out to you about this article? I mean, there's it it a lot to touch on, so we can touch on the main stuff. But Yeah, that's a good question. Let me grab, let me look at some of these other quotes. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. So he's talking about the, the whole ecosystem of data transformation. So... Mm. One of his remarks is, second, data warehouses have unlocked an entire ecosystem of tools and companies that revolve around them. ETL, ELT, reverse ETL, warehouse-centric data quality tools, metric stores, augmented analytics, et cetera. Yeah, and I think that's another key trend. Um, it, it's funny that the data warehouses are not trying to own this end-to-end -end so far. I think Snowflake has kind of made some movement in this direction in terms of offering more capabilities within their core product. But for the most part, um, these turn out to be external tools that become a control layer for your data warehouse somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, then there's also the rise of data warehouses themselves, which he touches on. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Exactly. And I think you had some thoughts on that. Yeah, just that I think data warehouses um, are gradually replacing traditional on-prem data warehouses. 
but they're um, they're also they have a core big data use case, right? Like they're they become very important for big data applications that are not conformant to some of the existing assumptions for data warehouses, like very tightly managed Kimball star schemas, for example. Um, I think Kimball is still important, but not for all types of data within a data warehouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like good old days. Like feature stores are focusing on data warehouses as well, I believe. <clears throat> is that kind of your understanding? Uh, sort of, sort of not. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would say for uh, offline data, it, it's it's a possible storage mechanism as well as an ingestion mechanism as well as features. But yeah, yeah in general, it, it's interesting. I, I would say for as many use cases, if you zoom out for as many use cases yeah. in data, um, there's probably a product or a, a, a company that's servicing that use case. Yeah. So what are you talking about data warehouses, feature stores, metric stores, which is a new one that he touches on, um, you know, or any, any other uh, use case. Now it's all about fine grain tuning. So this brings up a very interesting question. What does this mean for data engineering? Uh, again, back in the good old days, back in the days of, of Hadoop and so forth, uh, Spark, et cetera, et cetera, which wasn't in 2012. Right. But, um, you know, you just had to know, uh, you know, sort of an ecosystem I would dare say a monolithic ecosystem of tools, uh, you know, in the Hadoop ecosystem, you know, um, but it's nothing like today, right? right? I mean, this is insane. And it's only going to keep growing. There's, there's every incentive for somebody to start a data company at this point. I mean, we've been tossed around the idea and maybe we will at some point because uh, there's a lot of money in this space. I, yeah. I would say, um, so there's nothing stopping anybody from starting a, uh, a data company of their choice. So... What, what do you think this, this means for data engineers, uh, not just in 2021, but for the next few years? Yeah, it's a very tricky problem, right? Um, we, we talk frequently about the notion of resume-driven development or shiny object syndrome, where people kind of chase technology because it's interesting or because they want to be doing something cool. Um, I think there are a lot of really great ideas amongst all these different startups. There are a lot of very useful tools. The problem is that if you pick the wrong one, then you end up wasting a ton of resources if the yeah. company ultimately doesn't survive or doesn't become a big enough player to have good interop with other tools, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so th that's, yeah, that's very tricky. I don't know, what are your thoughts on this? Like my, my attitude is keep an eye on what's out there, right? Like you really, part of your job is to stay on top of what's current, but you should also have a high barrier for adoption. Like don't adopt new technology unless it's really gonna be useful or has such a big market yeah. share that you know it's going to be around for a long time. I mean, you still want it to be useful, but you want to make sure you're not adopting something that's just a flash in the pan that's going to waste a lot of time and resources. That's definitely a good point. Some other things I would say is uh, focus on lifecycle management. Again, you know, the thing I like about his, his landscape is he, he looks at things like infrastructure, analytics, um, and, and subsets of this, like data integration, reverse ETL, and so forth. I would say be prepared to pick the best of breed tool for today. But given the amount of competition in the space, always be willing and ready to uh, make a move to something better. And this means designing for interoperability, as you say. It, it means designing for modularity. It means uh, being able to swap out um, whatever component in your pipeline, uh, say reverse ETL, uh, for something that might be better down the road. And so that's how I view this landscape right now. You, you can't afford to get tied into uh, a monolithic solution. And so what does this mean from the perspective of a cloud? I'd like to talk about this for a bit. Clouds, if you go to a cloud vendor, they'll tend to sell you their maybe complete suite of tools for their ecosystem. And I say there's some pros to this in the sense where you know everything will work in the cloud. That said, uh, if you look at this uh, graphic, for example, how many of these are actually um, you know, cloud uh, first products in the sense where it's offered by the cloud themselves. Some of these will partner with clouds via a marketplace. Some of them won't. Um, and so it's a question of what kind of user experience you want. If, if you go an entire Azure stack, for example, you're going to be using Azure all the way down. There may be a best of breed tool out there from a third party from any, any number of these like bajillion uh, companies out here but you need to understand if it operates with that cloud and, and what the experience is like. Does it, does it, is it an easy experience? Is it a poor experience? Um, I, I would say that's something you also need to be aware of. 
um, because the clouds will try and get you to, into their ecosystem, um, you know, typically 100%, right? So you're just all in. Yeah. But there might be something better out there. Now, the question is, does it work in that cloud? Or are you going to have to go through a lot of machinations, like setting up uh, EC2 instances, Docker images, Kubernetes to use this technology? And how cost effective is that versus what a cloud offers? So, yeah. Exactly. And, and the thing to keep in mind is not just the complication of standing up, say, a cluster for airflow, but like what's your operational burden going to be? Yeah. So back when I like, would stand up my own airflow a few years back on EC2, I would have it like go down on Thanksgiving Day and I would have to go in and fix it. <laughs> like, Sounds no one fun. Have to deal with that. And it creates a bottleneck for your data reliability and availability, right? So, yeah, having like a well managed, um, service provided by a cloud vendor or by a third party does make a big difference. But the, the maturity of these services really varies. And so you really have to do your homework to decide how good it's actually do homework. in terms of SLA and quality. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, because all these companies are at a different stage of maturity. Right. And I would say that the hidden secret when operating with a cloud is that they're at uh, different stages in their relationships with these clouds. Right. If you're trying to negotiate good pricing uh, with a cloud, it definitely helps if uh, a third-party product is available in that cloud's marketplace, for example. Yeah. Um, because then the salesperson you're negotiating with from the cloud gets possibly gets comped, compensated on the uh, sale of that product, right? Uh, if they don't, then it's sort of out of sight, out of mind. I mean, clouds make their money off of two things. It's, it's uh, compute and storage. Right, right, so, right. Yeah. But overall, they're interested, frankly, in lock-in, and that is they want to get you involved in a lot of these proprietary solutions because that means you'll just keep growing your yep. footprint, right? Like, for example, Amazon Kinesis, great product. Um, you can certainly migrate off of it. It's a little bit of work. <clears throat> but still, you know, once you're on Kinesis, like, eh, the barrier for you to get off of Kinesis is going to be somewhat high. It's like, well, I could go to Google and use PubSub or... I could stand up Kafka, but do I really want to do that? It's going to be just way easier to stick with Kinesis. Yeah, so I think it's understanding the trade-offs of, of where you want to put your efforts. Because yeah. it's not just total cost of ownership. It's also a uh, total opportunity cost of ownership, as we say. And, and, and so there, there's also, um, uh, you got to look at things like funding. So again, most of these companies here, uh, I'm wagering, have received some sort of uh, VC funding, right? But we are, we are talking to a client just this morning about a, a product they were looking at. And I looked in Crunchbase and that, that company had only raised a couple million bucks and yet they're competing in the um, data integration space against, you know, companies like maybe a five tran, for example, which has raised $565 million recently on top of everything else they've raised. And so, you know, it, it's, it's very much a, a Pareto uh, distribution in terms of how these companies have received funding, how they're uh, deploying their capital. Um, and how they're competing in the marketplace. I, I would say that it's it's definitely David um, versus a couple of Goliaths within each yeah. of these segments here. So yeah, it's interesting. I mean, are we going to end up with a runaway leader problem at some point? In other words, mm. some of these you know startups that have been around for a couple of years have so much money that even if you have a really fantastic idea in the space, it's going to be very hard to raise enough money to possibly compete against the big player, even though they're not a public company yet, say. Well, I mean, Matt Turk brings up an interesting point in his article too, right? So the, the public companies have raised obviously a ton of money and are growing their revenues at an astounding rate. Right. Uh, this puts them in a prime position for M&A. But as he points out, M&A activity has actually slowed, at least in 2021, I think because of these insane valuations, it, it doesn't make any sense for a company who's a startup to sell just yet. I mean, if you, like, why would you do that? It's well, he's not he's rational. The example of Databricks, right? Says, yeah, there were rumors that maybe Microsoft would buy Databricks, but Databricks is now valued so high that like no one, it, it wouldn't really be an acquisition. It would basically- It's like $100 billion, billion, right? To get to go <laughs> buy them. <laughs> no, like Microsoft doesn't want to merge with Databricks. They want to acquire them. That's just not going to happen. <laughs> right. But it's funny because Azure, you know, in, in a lot of ways, I could argue, um, built Databricks, you know, by having yeah. Databricks as a first class citizen with an Azure. And so that's yeah. second party, like basically yep. right in the console, almost like a native Microsoft service. Right. Yeah. And what's fascinating, too, with this is, you know, uh, it, the article also talks about how Snowflake and Databricks were, were partners at one point, And we'd, we'd seen this in the past. And now, you know, they're, they're on a collision course, uh, two giants. And what that means is, you know, at some point uh, in order to be competitive, it's a build versus buy question. Are you, are you going to build the internal um, competencies in this gigantic yeah. ecosystem 
or are you simply just going to buy the best of breed technologies within each of these um, uh, ecosystems? I can foresee a situation where Databricks, Snowflake, um, and all the you know the major cloud vendors end up scooping up a lot of these products, really, and that becomes more of a uh, you know I, I guess a battle of now five clouds. Um, so. It of course assumes that uh, you know your, your snowflakes and databricks uh, spin up their own version of a cloud and aren't relying upon the third-party clouds, but it's going to get very competitive. Uh, I think if you think this year's been competitive, you ain't seen nothing yet. Oh, I mean, we're just laying the groundwork for what 2022 is going to look like, right? Yeah, <laughs> and, I, and Martin has a good point here. I mean, those who uh, make the market don't often win it. Yeah, I mean, let me let me go back to 2012. I mean, I, I was around in data at this at this time. I remember this. Uh, I remember thinking, wow, there's so many companies, how do you choose? Um, I mean, if you look at this, you, you tell me how many of these companies are still around. Yeah, well, think about Cloudera, right? I mean, Cloudera is still doing fine, but they're not like the hot market leader that they used to be. And I mm -hmm. think a lot of Cloudera installations have basically just been replaced by like Amazon EMR, for example. So yeah, totally made the market. And because it's open source, someone was, was able to swoop in and create a product that was very easy to deploy. Right. And just a click away in the console. And so it was very hard to compete with that. Right. Yeah. And Cloudera and Hortonworks used to be uh, enemies. And then, you know, they merged and map are, you know, yeah. and, and so forth. But a lot of these, I mean, uh, Hadapt, I haven't, you know, heard of them for a long time. And Zetaset and Tengen and all these others. So the whole point is, yeah. you know, what, what's new today is old or dead tomorrow. And this happens at an incredibly fast rate. Uh, the amount of churn I think you're going to see with companies either getting uh, purchased and taken out of, uh, you know, the scene or just, uh, you know, going out of business. I think you're going to see a lot of that happening just because there is a lot of competition. Uh, I mean, it's a question I always ask my, uh, you know, my VC friends and tech friends. It, it, it's like, OK, um, you have all, all these companies. It's not like these are just founded by uh, dummies. Right. These are all funded, you know, started by um you know, well-educated, typically, you know, uh, well-invested people with, with great pedigrees from top companies. Yep. Um, how do you pick winners in this space? The, the common thing I hear from VCs is they, it's, it's hard to evaluate in technology alone. And so you have to evaluate the team. But if every team is as good as the other team, <laughs> then I, I guess there's, there has to be a bit of luck involved in succeeding, which there always is in success. But in this yeah. case, uh, it'll be fascinating to watch. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, no matter how fantastic your idea in the data space right now, if you go start a company, you get you risk just get kind of getting drowned by all the competition that's out there at the moment. So it, it puts you in an interesting kind of moral dilemma. Going back to what you were saying earlier, on the one hand, you could uh, start a company just to scoop up some of the money that's floating around. On the other hand, It's like, is that the best use of that money or could it go somewhere? Well, but you, well, I mean, it's good if it goes to you, but then you got to you got to execute. Right. It's not like these exactly. VCs are giving you money just because they're, they, they like you. And, you know, I mean, they, they need a return on their capital. And especially given how competitive the, the venture capital industry is right now. Um, you need to, you know, you need to return a lot more. And, and you know, I remember seeing stats that 90 percent of VC firms can't even beat the S&P index. So it really is a winner take all market in VC as well, where the top VC firms continue to be the top VC firms because they are the top VC firms. And that's that. And if you want to make a, a dent, I mean, and, and so technology is always one of those things where it pays to make bets in the left field in a lot of times where, where unexpected success might happen. Um, you know, because if you were to, if you're to tell me about the venture capital space and data back in, say 2008 or 2007, how many, you know, you would typically be saying, well, okay, I need, uh, I need enterprise BI, I need um, OLAP, uh, cubes, that kind of stuff reports. You would have entire, if you took the standard thesis, you would have entirely missed uh, the big data industry that was about to be happening. And if you took a conservative approach, uh, I don't think your returns would have been that great. And so, but a lot of this landscape is, is fueled by just the insane amount of capital out yeah. there right now is my, my thesis, so. I think and cloud, right? I would I would make that argument. Yeah, cloud too. What I mean yeah. by that is um, th there's a big difference between these products and the more Hadoop on-prem focused products of like right. five to ten years ago, which is that 
and you were alluding to this earlier, these are all designed for interop, right? They're not designed to sit on one stack and just like run inside your Hadoop stack. They're run, designed to run in a cloud and then talk to all kinds of other systems. And so that is going to lead to proliferation um, with, with this emphasis on lots of different systems talking to each other. Just combinatorially, you end up with a lot more activity going on. A lot more activity. And combinatorially, what's not on here are the startups using these, start these services. That's true. That are also yeah. being funded by VCs. Yeah. And so this is presents, I think, an even greater combinatorial problem um, than lets on with this Lumascape, which, by, by, as we touched on, is not complete. Uh, so, I mean, there, as I joked the other day, I mean, there's, there's, there's probably more data startups now than there are atoms in the known universe. It seems so. Right. <laughs> you know? um, but there's also more money being, uh, you know, pumped out by, by the Fed at this point than known atoms in the universe. So uh, you can make that argument. But um, yeah. <laughs> that, that's a but whole that, long discussion. That's a different. That's a, I don't even get me started on yeah, that. Yeah. Um, but the whole point is, you know, there's there's a what that means is there's just a lot of consumption all the way around, right? There's a lot of ideas being generated to serve uh, startups and companies. There's a lot of new companies. Um, although I, I could also make an argument, actually, net new uh, company creation, I think, is lower than it used to be uh, in the United States. But that's a different discussion, which means that more money is actually being deployed to uh, um, fewer opportunities, which you also see in, in venture capital stats, where I think the there's there's fewer deals being made, but the amount of money is is greater right now. Yeah, so, everyone wants to bet on the next Google or Facebook, right? Yep. No one's interested in a company that sells for fifty million dollars down the road. To or the next Snowflake. Company. Yeah, I think that's yeah, also that's, what yeah. propelled a lot of this. When you see a company like Snowflake, um, you know, uh, at, at its valuation, I mean. If you're, you know, if you see, I mean, that's a very tempting thing, which means you're going to see valuations go up. So it's like, well, Snowflake's up, so therefore the entire market is up because all, you know, rising tide and all. So yeah, and I think that's right. I mean, one of these companies in this Lumascape is, is probably going to be a Google-sized company. It could be Snowflake, or maybe it's some other entrant in the mix. I don't know, but I, I think that opportunity certainly exists. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's the crazy thing about tech is yeah. you know it's always the underdog, right? You never right. count them out. If you do that, you do that at your own expense because today's underdog is tomorrow's. Uh, big I remember when Snowflake was an underdog. Yeah. I remember when Databricks was an underdog. I remember going to workshops, with, you know, for Databricks back in like 2014 or 2015. And it's like, you know, um, this is Spark. Uh, you know, I had been using Spark when it was first uh, released uh, in 2014. Um, and so, you know, it's an open source project. And then it was like, this is cool. Um, no idea where this is going to go. It's cool seeing, you know, um, you know, that's like Databricks, that's cool. I'm glad they're pushing the envelope with uh, this new technology. And and here they are now competing, you know, head to head with you know, some of the biggest companies in the world. And so. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I, I saw a Databricks demo. It was probably 2016 and I didn't quite right. get it. I'm like, well, it's just Spark. Like, what's the big deal? <laughs> right. <laughs> How things change. <laughs> what things change? I mean, they, they you know, uh, pivoted to a, you know, a lake house and. Yep. But then uh, Snowflake pivoted to a data cloud and, you know, that's kind of how it goes. I mean, there's, there's not just new entrants, but there's also the pivots the entrants make as they, as they mature yeah, and, and define new categories. When we, last night we were talking about how people are kind of, um, I'll try to, <laughs> people are on LinkedIn are spending a lot of time arguing about what is and what not is not a data warehouse, right? Mm. Like lots of debate about what the proper schema is. And I feel like these new entrants, including Databricks, Snowflake, BigQuery, Redshift, have just kind of kicked the door open to say, well, it doesn't really matter anymore. Like these tools we have can serve that traditional data warehouse model. But again, they can do all kinds of new things too. And you should focus on the new stuff in addition to the stuff you're already doing on-prem. Right. Yeah, it's a great article by Matt Turk. I, I think that this, uh, I, I always look forward to, uh, to his articles every year. Um, uh, him and who was it, Mary Meeker is a state of the internet report. I always look forward to her stuff as well. Um, I think from, uh, you know, I think they both just have some of the best analysis of the industry out there right now. And I mean, it's obvious that, you know, uh, Matt Turk and his team spent a lot of time uh, on this uh, information and it shows this is a very thorough report. I, I would say this is, um, but, but it's, it's awesome. And, and I think it benefits the industry, just people in the industry, just to look at what's happening in this. Uh, again, uh, this is uh, at matturk.com. I think you can also find it on, uh, well, just find it here, matturk.com. It's the first thing that pops up. And again, this is just an insane uh, graphic. Uh, curious to see what 20, um, 22 looks like. And you want to make a bet? I mean, does this, does this grow or shrink? Well, so partially it's going to depend on filtering, right? So 
and he's already filtering to some extent. So one option is that he, he just filters more and says, all right, we're only mm. going to worry about, you know, the top so many companies because there are just too many entrants. This is getting too ridiculous. Yeah. Or he can just make his map bigger, which I wouldn't blame him for doing that either, because there is a lot of interesting activity by early stage startups. What's your prediction for consolidation of the data industry? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think going back to what you were saying earlier, um, I think that cloud vendors are going to jump in and try to buy some of these players before they get to the kinds of valuations that Databricks has. The, the problem is that we've seen a very mixed track record with acquisitions, right? Like so many of these acquired companies, frankly, just get kind of run into the ground. Like, yeah, they keep selling their core product, but just development essentially stops. They stop evolving. They actually don't get integrated into the parent company's products very well. Um, so... I, I think we will see acquisitions, whether those turn out to be real successful in terms of creating better cloud platforms, that remains to be seen. Yeah, I agree. I think the wild card too is just interest rates and what that does to the uh, flow of capital. Yeah. Um, who knows? I'm not a macroeconomist. I, I also think macro uh, economics is kind of voodoo, but that's a different subject. But I, I do, th you know, um, the tautology is uh, interest rates go up as the prices go down, stock prices go down. These companies have a lot less attractive um, offerings that they can offer, you know, possible acquisition targets because it's a cheaper stock. But valuations, I think, would also go down. But again, that's a thesis for another day and an argument for another day. Point being, I, I see that as being sort of the uh, the thing that could impact consolidation as well, for better or for worse. So. Another mm -hmm. interesting comment he makes is that a lot of what's happening in the startup space is that VCs don't want these companies going public anymore, right? He, he used the analogy mm -hmm. of they want to turn over more cards, like in a poker game, before they finally, yep, before they hold. Um, and well, it's VCs and the founders, really. I mean, it, you know, it's putting yourself in their shoes, though. If you're a founder, it's like, do you really want to sell this early if you could, if you could possibly, uh, you know, um, raise or, or get, you know, uh, a greater valuation at tack on a few more billions on your valuation? I mean, why not? <laughs> And so, yet there's still been this big IPO pop, but to be quite frank, <laughs> often it's the like weaker companies that jump for an IPO and the strong ones just bring in more private capital through VCs. <laughs> so it's, it's a very- Yeah, but they eventually have to IPO, right? I mean, that's kind of the end game of it, it, right? Yeah. So you can see a lot of companies doing SPACs now, but I think SPACs have sort of, a, you know, crapped out in terms of performance, um, you know, at least lately. But it's an easy way to, you know, to, to go public if you wanted to do that and make a bunch of money, which- no, if you look at it from the lens of a founder and a VC, I mean, that's the only um, real outcome you care about is, is getting a return on that valuation at some point. Yeah. Um, you're, not, you're, not, you're not doing this because you're philanthropic or anything. You're doing this because no. you want to make money. So, <laughs> you may say that you want to make the world a better place, but <laughs> we know the truth. You want to make the world a better place for your pocketbook. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, you know, um, anyway, if audience has any questions, uh, actually, it looks like Guy Thompson has a question here. Um, chances that a larger company comes in, begins acquiring these small companies to integrate them into existing software. I, I would say that's almost a hundred percent. Um, given, given your, uh, question there. Yeah. Again, you know, we're not VCs, we're not experts in, in investing in the tech space, but I think we deal with enough tools and we've been around the space long enough to have an opinion on this. And again, these are opinions, but again, oh, when I talk to VCs, everything I hear from a VC is just an opinion anyway. They, they lay it out like it's some like grand thesis, but at the end of the day, it's just an opinion like everybody else. So, Yeah, I mean, how many truly successful big unicorns have we had? I mean, you've got a handful of big tech companies. There's just not enough data to try to make any real prediction about where you should invest. Not to mention that the world has just fundamentally changed. Like it changes so quickly that any prediction you would try to make would be invalid anyway. It would be invalid. But the interesting thing he points out in the article too is, you know, he points out that uh, ML and AI companies typically have, you know, a multiple of valuation over non AI and ML companies. But what I, what I found fascinating, and these are public companies, what I found fascinating in that discussion is he didn't talk about profits uh, or things that matter when you are a public company, which is basically making a profit and, you know, earnings per share. And so, you know, you could be cash flow positive, I suppose, and that, that's one way to look at it. And that's how I would say a lot of unprofitable companies justify their valuation or using uh, EBITDA, which I know um, Charlie Munger always refers to as, uh, you know, um, BS earnings. Um, but, you know, again, it's, it's not really an argument that I have an opinion on or not because I'm not investing in, in this type of stuff. So it doesn't really matter to me.
Yeah. So. Yeah. It's interesting because I mean, I, I feel like Amazon really changed the conversation around profitability because they were unprofitable for so long. And yet look at where they are now. So, but mm -hmm. <laughs> like not everyone should be using uh, Amazon as an example. Like it's total survivorship bias. Like oh, it is survivorship bias for sure. Amazon did it, we should be doing it too. Right. Right. Yeah. Ask DevOps always has good questions here. I rarely see companies, uh, having success criteria for ML models and teams. So this is a bit of a different discussion than the Matt Shark one, but let's, uh, let's take this on. Uh, how should a company see this as return on investment when they start having a machine learning team? What are your thoughts? That's interesting. I mean, I would advise uh, listeners to look at the, his conversation about model ops. I, I found that pretty fascinating. And I think model ops kind of fits into this bigger conversation of actually monitoring uh, model performance, including presumably financial performance over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's, I think it also depends on the size of team and the, and the data maturity of the company in which that team exists. Yeah. So... In a separate, I mean, I actually wrote about this in our newsletter, which, by the way, if you haven't subscribed to our newsletter at ternarydata.com, please do. You'll get uh, articles like the one I wrote uh, that are exclusive to the newsletter and are not published. But we talked about um, calculating ROI for data teams. And so I think there's two ways to approach this. There's really two types of teams. There's a product-facing team that faces external customers. And I think that initiative has an ROI because you can calculate how much money that product's making. Um, internally though, if you're doing internal, uh, ML or data, it's harder. And so I would say that needs to be an SLA, uh, for example, like, uh, how quickly am I delivering data in high quality, uh, that's reliable to stakeholders? How quickly can they do their jobs and how effectively can they do their jobs? So I'd say that's one metric that I would look at for, um, you know, uh, success criteria and return on investment. I do think that internal facing teams, data teams are just much harder to evaluate ROI on, unless you're doing some sort of uh, activity-based costing, which would provide direct attribution of a um, of a team or, and its engineers against the outcomes they produce. Any thoughts? Yeah, the other thing I'd say is that um, a lot of companies are tempted to just go try to start an ML team, but and this is something you write about in the book, right? You really need the data maturity to be at an appropriate level before you even attempt to do that. So you should really be starting with like more of a data engineering team to build those foundations. And eventually, you can get to an ML team. If you try to put the cart before the horse, then you're not likely to get too much value out of your initiative. Yeah, and I would say that it, it, the generic data team uh, success criteria can apply to an ML team as well, yeah. given some nuances. Right. But in general, it's you know again, it's it's about delivery, it's about reliability, um, and those sorts of things. Obviously, again, if it's a product facing team, see, so you're making a recommendation engine, you know, or um, like how much money is that bringing in? I think that's pretty quantifiable, right? You either pay for your team or you don't. Yeah. So, but good question. Yeah. Uh, Marin asks, uh, since we're talking about new names, how long do you expect the big old names, Oracle, IBM to stick around? Want to open up, you want to open up this uh, can of worms here? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's funny, like the death of IBM has been predicted for a long, long time. Um, and, and frankly, they, I think they have had kind of a rough patch, but IBM has always managed to come back to some extent. We'll see if that continues to happen. Um, Oracle's an interesting one too, because one of the interesting things that happened with Oracle, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of Oracle Cloud, frankly. I think it's way behind the other ones, but one of the moves they made during the pandemic was to really reduce data egress costs, which was supposedly a major factor in them getting Zoom on board with their cloud. And so who knows, maybe Oracle turns into a huge cloud just by trying a different pricing strategy and then their products get better as the money flows in. That's certainly a possibility. So, I mean, I would never underestimate any company out there, well, especially companies with a lot of money. A lot of money and a lot of success, right? I mean, quite frankly, like Oracle just has an amazing sales process. It's very aggressive, but they've been in business successfully for a long time. And if they can manage to like take that and pivot and really do cloud right, then they could become a major player in the space. They could. I would never write anybody out. I mean, I remember when Microsoft was written off for dead. Yeah. Who provides, I would, I would say, the best uh, developer experience right now? I'm going to argue Microsoft out of any company. It, it's funny. Um, you know, Microsoft several years ago was just this stodgy company and everyone just stayed away from it. Right. Uh, tell me how many, how many people use VS Code now? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right? And uh, GitHub, um, right? I mean, that was right. an acquisition. But and LinkedIn. Yeah. So, but that's different. Uh, yeah, but GitHub, um, yeah, VS Code. I mean, I would say 
Microsoft is like the company in term, uh, who's been the most progressive in terms of developer experience. And so it's hard to say anything could happen. So I, I just don't even try and, and write anyone up for dead because it's um, every time I've done that, I just look in, insanely stupid. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, I mean, they've been talking about the death of IBM since the 90s when they really, you know, lost the PC market. It's like, well, they, they've done they've done pretty OK since then. Like they haven't been spectacularly successful since the 90s, but they, they certainly maintained a solid business presence and they may have another really successful era. I mean, I was listening to an interview with uh, who was it, Michael Dell on the A16 yeah. podcast uh, the other day, and he was talking about how he thinks actually the, the, the clouds are uh, going to go out. Now, obviously, Michael Dell has a vested interest in saying such things. Right. But again, it could be Dell that ends up being, you know, the king of decentralized, uh, you know, computing uh, for businesses. So it's, it's incredibly difficult to say, I would say, given just the explosion of companies. What I would say is there's an explosion of groupthink. Yeah. Right. And so everyone, you know, all these, a lot of the companies that are coming out, they all try and ride the same wave, um, which is fine. Uh, but I would say that the biggest leaps you see in technology are not by those who are trying to copy each other. It's by those who fundamentally hit, uh, you know, reset and hit a you know, um, completely different uh, inflection point, really, uh, and start one. Like that, that's kind of where I see, I've always seen the, the biggest uh, changes in technology. And this is coming from somebody who's been, you know, in the modern Internet since before it was modern. So I think I know what I'm talking about. I've seen just every trend that's happened. And every time, that's why I don't even bother trying to give predictions in this stuff anymore, because every time I've done that, it, I've been proven wrong. Yeah, so. I mean, you can kind of predict the near term, right? But by the very nature of a dramatic sea change, you're not going to be able to predict it. You know, someone will randomly guess and get be right, but for the most part, you're not going to see it coming. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, a guy says, uh, if Oracle could make NetSuite more approachable to small and mid-sized businesses, they would do themselves a lot more favors. I'm always confused by NetSuite's uh, uh, advertisements, too, because on podcasts, they always say, well, it's for when you outgrow QuickBooks. And so I'm like, oh, is that for like a small business or a medium business? Uh, like, but I don't know. I think it's kind of funny. Um, SDevOps says 40% uh, of the companies I see here is something like open source plus added customer service equals voila, new company. So yeah, that, that's a lot of, I would say what these, uh, you know, these companies are is they're building upon open source um, to some degree, you know, maybe it's their own open source project they come out with and they form a company around that. Uh, we know a lot of companies like that. We partner with a lot of companies like that. It can be successful. They can, yeah. I think it remains to be seen, but there is this new kind of fascinating open source model. I mean, obviously the open source software support model has been around for a long time, but the, the new model is, you create an open source framework and you don't even worry about revenue for several years. You're just like grow mind share, grow mind share. And then eventually you come up with a product on top of that, where you try to get people in that mind share to yep. migrate into your managed product. That's right. Yeah. I think we've heard of as commercial open source um, where basically it's or open source light where, you know, you'll, you'll open source uh, a piece of, um, you know, the core functionality, but then you'll uh, design a bunch of wrappers around, Right. That open source to keep kind of a walled garden uh, yep. for your managed offering. And again, it works. I mean, that's how Databricks got started. So, yep. you know, I mean, they've, they've uh, showed the roadmap for doing this. Um, I would say the biggest uh, challenge that I see a lot of these companies having is that they compete with themselves. Exactly right. Yeah, it's always a question of like, where do I set that boundary? Like, where is the wall between what's free and what's going to start costing people money? And if you if you don't put enough features in the open source product, then you people start jumping ship from the open source product. But if you took, put too many in, then nobody wants to pay you money. <laughs> like it's, right. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, why do that? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's interesting. And, and the number of open source projects I see now is just astounding. Um, so, I mean, again, it comes back to just, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of startups Right now, a lot of companies, big companies, all in the data space. Um, kind of wrap it up. You got to just reshare this again. Um, you know, Matt Turk, again, check out his article, Red Hot, the 2021 Machine Learning AI and Data Landscape. Uh, the acronym is MAD. I totally agree with it. <laughs> so it's bananas. Um, but uh, any other closing thoughts on this? Um, go read the article. It's quite mm -hmm. long. It's really fascinating. There are a lot of really, gro uh, really great quotes in here and really great ideas. So it's definitely worth checking out. Um, go debate it on Twitter, basically. Like, oh, yeah, definitely debate things on Twitter. That's a healthy thing to do. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, I think it's better to be debating this than like vaccines or something. <laughs> on Twitter.
Yeah, that's true. Yeah, Twitter. I, I got off of Twitter. Um, if anyone wants to see me back on Twitter, uh, let me know. I could. I, I'm thinking about restarting an account. Um, I need a lot of incentive to do that. So, uh, for the but, sake of your sanity, yeah, maybe it's a bad idea. It just moment. got. It got very. Uh, how would I say? Derpy uh, over the last yeah. several years. I think that's the like right, the appropriate half the people. I'm like, how do you even turn on your phone in the morning, let alone type? There are so many ways to respond to that. <laughs> well, if, a lot of them are bots, right? Yeah, so yeah. there's that. <laughs> so, um, well, cool. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, thanks for uh, you know showing up to the Monday morning data chat. Um, subscribe to our YouTube at Ternary Data. Uh, we're always looking for um, you know uh, people to uh, enjoy our content. Also, subscribe to our newsletter at ternarydata.com. We have exclusive articles like the one I mentioned where we talk about ROI for data teams that will only be found in the newsletter. Um, and so, yeah, it's awesome. And, and uh, coming up this week, too, I'm going to be uh, chatting with Brian Olson. We have a new Wednesday show. Uh, we, haven't had a we haven't come up with a title yet, but it's like kind of like the friends and uh, family and awesome, com awesome things that we like uh, show. So... We're going to be talking with uh, Brian Olson from Trino and Starburst. He's going to be uh, talking about Trino and Starburst. So I think this is a really good opportunity for uh, companies to talk about their cool projects in a way that's, um, you know, uh, a bit different than the Monday morning data chat. We tend to be very agnostic to technologies and partners and vendors here. It's not a commercial outlet, uh, but this one kind of leans more towards that. Again, it's not an infomercial uh, but at least you can find out some of the cool stuff that we're uh, finding out there in the market and you can hear it from the people who are making it happen. It's almost so. like a VC pitch. You, you get to hear all the different <laughs> VC pitches on this this podcast. That should be a lot of fun. So. Sure. It's exactly. And then also I'm speaking at the uh, Dedicated Expo tomorrow. So for uh, people who follow Dedicated, come check me out as well as countless other awesome people. we got Andreas Kretz, Harpreet, uh, Scott Taylor, uh, Susan, and everybody else going to be talking there. So the Dedicated Expo I'll be talking about ETL versus ELT in a quick 10 minute uh, talk. So check that out. And I think we're doing a let's talk data engineering on Friday. I'm not sure yet, but uh, nice. okay. if we are, we'll let you know our buddy Chris Tab always joins us from the UK. Yeah. So. And we're going to have more to say about ETL versus ELT on a number, another one of these Monday morning data chats. It's an upcoming topic just for this show too. So. Yeah, it is. Uh, we may come up with a new acronym. I'm not sure if it's BLT or, or something, but uh <laughs> I Stay have an opinion. That. I'm going to hold hold my tongue for the moment. And we'll Please do. Talk about it. That's, I'm going to be happy to talk about it. Yeah. But yeah, subscribe to our YouTube, Ternary Data. Check out the newsletter, ternarydata.com. And we'll see you next Monday. Thanks for uh, checking out the Monday morning data chat. And we'll see you next time. Take care. Take care. Is it going to end the broadcast? It's still going. <laughs> okay. I'll just, I'll just leave the studio then. All right. Okay. All right. Take <laughs> care. Bye-bye. <laughs>